Hello and welcome. This is the Asia Law Speaker Series of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. And I'm Catherine Wilhelm, uh, the Executive Director. Our topic today is the dispute in the South China Sea between China and the Philippines. And as many of you will know, this dispute is not new, but since last summer, it has been heating up to the point where vessels from the two countries are having increasingly dangerous encounters involving uh, laser weapons, water cannons, and even ships ramming each other. So we decided to invite some experts to explain why this dispute is back in the headlines and where things are headed. Our guest speaker is uh, Jay Batong Bacal, a professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law, where he leads the Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea. In addition to his scholarship, Professor Batong Bacal has been an advisor to the Philippine government in some of its work to win international legal recognition for its maritime claims. And we've posted his, his full biography on our website uh, so you can uh, see his many uh, achievements there. Uh, as discussant, we have with us Peter Dutton, a professor of international law at the US Naval War College and adjunct professor at NYU School of Law, where he teaches a course on China's approach to international law. Like Professor Baton Bacal, Professor Dutton is a longtime expert on the law of the sea and the impacts of China's claims to sovereignty over much of the South China Sea. So a very warm welcome to both of you. And now I'm going to hand the mic over to Professor Dutton. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Jay Batang Bakal with us uh, this, this uh, evening or morning or afternoon, depending on where you happen to be. Um, the, the problems really began in 2012 uh, when, when Scarborough Shoal, uh, an incident at Scarborough Shoal occurred and uh, uh, the, where Philippine fishermen were and, uh, chased out of Scarborough Shoal uh, where they had been fishing for a long time and where, uh, where not only the Philippines claims sovereignty but claims the rights to fish. Uh, in 2013, the Philippines initiated an arbitration uh, against China for a number of different issues, but one of them was the status of the various features in the South China Sea and what rights and duties uh, uh, pertain to those status. And one of the things that was very specifically challenged was China's nine dash line and historic rights uh, in the South China Sea, as, as China claims them. Uh, in 2016, uh, the arbitral tribunal handed the Philippines a pretty strong victory. Um, in other words, they said the South China Sea has to be um, uh, managed in accordance with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and not China's view of, of its uh, long held historic rights. Uh, and that means that uh, the areas around uh, the Philippines are part of the Philippine continental shelf and not some sort of waters that um, uh, apply to China. And this is where most of the action is today. Uh, and so here to tell us more, as Catherine has explained, is uh, Jay Batang Bakal. Uh, Jay, over to you. What's what's going on in uh, the, the waters off the Philippine islands? Hello, Peter, and uh, good morning or good evening or good day or good uh, for everyone who's uh, watching uh, today. Um, well, as we uh, had uh, mentioned earlier, the uh, frictions between the Philippines and China have been ongoing, and they particularly intensified in the past year uh, or two uh, with the new administration. And so in the last year, we've seen a very marked um, um, heightening of uh, tensions between the Philippines and China over these issues. But they have focused mostly around uh, this uh, other feature, uh, second thumb, I shall start with the first slide to give us uh, an overview. So since last year, uh, the frictions between the Philippines and China have increased over these competing maritime claims. And this map on the first slide uh, gives everyone a, just a broad idea of, of the locations and, and places we're looking at. You have Philippines on the right side and China up to the north, uh, west, up, uh, well, upper left uh, corner there. And you see that uh, we have there a uh, 200 mile EEZ um, being drawn around the surrounding smaller Southeast Asian uh, states. But 
it is overlapped by China's expansive claim represented here by the magenta nine dash lines. And in the lower middle, you have the Spratly Island group. Now that's a more complicated uh, dispute. Um, and Scarborough Shoal, which Peter mentioned, is on the upper uh, center there, that square. However, um, if you we go to the next slide, uh, this is actually Second Thomas Shoal or Ayumin Shoal there on the lower uh, center. Uh, it is a submerged coral uh, atoll, and uh, this is located approximately 105 nautical miles from the nearest coast, uh, nearest point of the coast of the island of Palawan, that long uh, slanting island there uh, near the middle, uh, which is a province of the Philippines. So I think uh, what you're, you're telling us, Jay, is that uh, Second Thomas Shoal is well within the exclusive economic zone of, yes. of the Philippines, yeah? Yes. Yes, and you see there, this is a large, uh, very large uh, feature, but it is mostly, uh, it is submerged actually uh, during high tide. And uh, it has been guarded essentially by the BRP Sierra Madre, a landing ship of the Philippine Navy. Uh, this ship has been stranded on the shoal since 1999 actually. Uh, however, despite that leng lengthy period and its immobilization, it has not been decommissioned and therefore, it remains in the active service of the Philippine Navy. Uh, this ship was stranded here in the aftermath of the covert construction and expansion of a facility on nearby Mischief Reef. Now, Mischief Reef is actually about 25 nautical miles further northwest. And uh, from 1992, uh, it has expanded immensely from just a few small huts to the largest artificial island, I think, in the world. No. Uh, and this uh, artificial island is a full-blown military base with ports and air and, and airstrip, an airstrip, as and it is also fully armed with anti-air and anti-ship missiles. So this is only 125 nautical miles away from Philippine land territory, actually. And Mischief Reef is only one of seven artificial islands that were built by China in a massive uh, island building spree and that lasted from 2014 to 2016. Now, uh, so if you compare that uh, with the Philippine case from 1999, a small contingent of Philippine Marines has been stationed continuously on the Sierra Madre, that rusting vessel I showed you earlier, uh, rotating uh, every few months. And of course that requires uh, supplies. So the Sierra Madre uh, has stood as an improvised outpost that stands guard not only on the shoal, uh, looking, trying to um, surveil uh, what's going on with Mischief Reef and its surroundings, but that's also um, it's also surveilling and monitoring uh, part that part of the Philippine EEZ down south, and that the Philippine EEZ uh, now is what we re often refer to as the West Philippine Sea, and the point of the Sierra Madre is to sort of um, stand as an outpost against further incursions by the People's Republic of China, okay? So on the next slide, you'll see that uh, since 2013, the People's Republic of China has been exerting and escalating really the pressure on Philippine ships that have been regularly conducting resupply missions to the Sierra Madre, okay? Um, for 15 years, we were quietly and peacefully just resupplying uh, the people there. But from 2014, uh, China transitioned into uh, radio warning. So before they would just shadow and do close-in observation of the ship, but then they began issuing radio warnings. Uh, and in 2014, after the Philippines had filed that arbitration case that Peter mentioned, uh, China prevented a seaborne uh, supply mission from uh, reaching the shoal, uh, forcing the Philippines to, to uh, do it by air dropping supplies. Okay. Uh, China also began sending fishermen to destroy the surrounding reef by clam digging operations. Uh, and that reduced the ability of the reef to sustain the small outpost there. Um, after 2014, it sort of uh, stopped for a while and then they resumed just the uh, shadowing and radio warnings. But in November 2021, the China Coast Guard used water cannon against two civilian resupply vessels on their approach to the shoal. And this was carried out at night uh, after dangerous maneuvers that uh, caused a near collision. No? The combination of these uh, maneuvers and the damage caused by the water cannon forced them to abort the mission. Um, the following year, in June 2022, 
uh, the China Coast Guard again carried out dangerous maneuvers to block the resupply vessels. Okay, but this time, uh, as you see in the next slide, uh, China also began exposing and pointing their shipboard weapons you know, uh, at the uh, Philippine vessels. Uh, in operations that year, also, the China Coast Guard was joined by several vessels of the Chinese maritime militia, a fleet of reinforced steel-hulled fishing vessels that do nothing, uh, that don't do anything but uh, um, uh, other, and they do everything other than fishing, apparently. And they were acting in coordination with the China Coast Guard in trying to prevent the resupply mission from pushing through. And in February 2023, just last year, they upped the ante again by using a laser to temporarily blind the crew of a Philippine Coast Guard vessel. And again, following it up with uh, dangerous maneuvers, uh, which were as close as 150 yards from the vessels. No? But by August that year, uh, the China Coast Guard also began to use their water cannon to dissuade the Philippine ships. So as uh, I think there's a photo in the next slide. Uh, so China has uh, steadily upped the ante by increasing the number of uh, vessels in its interference operations, reaching as many as uh, 38, uh, I think, in the, in the last one, uh, in the latest one, um, about November last year, uh, while the Philippines has consistently sent only four small ships uh, comprised of two wooden traditional boats, which carry the supplies, and they're escorted by uh, two uh, Philippine Coast Guard vessels. Um, and uh, as you see in the pictures there, uh, they're they're up against a a, uh, a number uh, a large number of Chinese vessels, a disproportionate number. Uh, we are outnumbered four to one in the last uh, case. Uh, now late late last year, these types of maneuvers and 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 actions instigated two collisions with the Philippine vessels on account of uh of these uh, um well reckless disregard really for. Um, for the safety rules and they never respected the uh, required distances under international law such as the collision regulations. So that's what's uh, been happening uh, um, in this area. And uh, now um, I, I assume that another resupply is probably being uh, um, organized right now. So we're actually waiting for the next incident in a way. Uh, probably within this week or the next week or two. Yeah. Well, your comments then are particularly timely, uh, Jay. Thanks very much for that uh, excellent summary. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned a few things that I'd like to uh, I'd like to clarify for some of our listeners who may not be fully um, familiar with various aspects of the law of the sea. So, one of the things that you showed was the. Um, the, on your first two two uh, charts, there you showed <clears throat> the exclusive economic zone uh, as uh, they are um, laid out in the South China Sea, according to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, what's the importance of the of the exclusive economic zone in relationship to Second Thomas Shoal, where all this uh, uh, friction is happening? Well, uh, in a way, um, Second Thomas Shoal now represents uh, the Philippines' exclusive economic zone continental shelf in the South China Sea. The Shoal has acquired a uh, huge symbolic value for both countries, really. On the part of the Philippines, uh, yeah, aside from representing the EEZ and, and, and continental shelf, the presence of the Sierra Madre is an exercise of the Philippines' jurisdiction. No, um, you could consider it both as the conduct of uh, uh, regular monitoring um, of the EEZ and activities around it. It's also um, it could also be considered as an artificial installation that has been placed uh, on the continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. And these are rights of the Philippines, according to UNGLOS. For China, however, um, um, it represents a rebuke of the Chinese uh, unilateral claim. Uh, after all, uh, um, the presence of that shoal means that the Philippines is actually exercising its jurisdiction over a 200-mile EEZ continental shelf, which China basically denies. It claims most of that and would leave the Philippines probably with only 20 nautical miles of water if, if they were to succeed. It also represents a resistance to the expansion of Chinese uh, maritime power in that region. 
and China's deployment of its uh, navy, coast guard, and militia is is precisely what that uh, represents. And it's also a thorn on the side of uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of China and their grand vision of uh, Chinese uh, maritime hegemony over East Asia. Um, we have heard some people say that uh, Xi Jinping has, uh, in a way, uh, taken an active personal interest in this particular feature because of what it uh, represents and how it challenges uh, China's views and intentions in the South China Sea. So, so you mentioned uh, the Philippine claim based on the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, as we refer to it. Um, and I mentioned, and I think you mentioned briefly too, the Chinese nine dash line claim. Maybe you could explain briefly what that's all about. Well, the nine dash line claim, which now is ten comprised of ten dashes, by the way, <laughs> based on the reissued map. Um, it's actually, it was originally an ambiguous claim um, that uh, was drawn originally by Taiwan, uh, although they refer to it as a U-shaped line rather than a nine-dash line. But the People's Republic of China adopted that ambiguous claim in uh, 1952. Originally, it seemed to indicate only a claim to the islands, all of the islands in the South China Sea, even though the original document that they issued also had several errors, like um, it indicated islands where they did not exist. Um, and uh, from 2009, uh, China began acting much more uh, aggressively in asserting its claims. No? And uh, it um, um, basically acted in a way that showed that it wasn't claiming just the islands, but all of the waters within that nine dash line. And the extent of uh, power and jurisdiction it was claiming what was not limited to just jurisdiction over uh, uh, resources, but even absolute sovereignty as if it were part of the Chinese Chinese land territory. Uh, that would effectively turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake, really. And that means that anyone who uses the South China Sea will have to seek uh, China's permission. And China would have, uh, if that were true, then China would ha have rights to deny any access to the South China Sea. So that's why it's rather uh, odious, um, especially for the Southeast Asian countries that have historically and traditionally used this as a common uh, sea area for uh, mm -hmm. fishing and the rest of the world, which has always been using this as a uh, crossroads for maritime traffic. Yeah, this is no small claim on the Chinese part, uh, right? It's um, for those of listeners who might be more familiar, uh, the South China Sea is actually about one and a half times the size of the entire Mediterranean Sea. So uh, for those of us uh, in this part of the world, that might be a little bit more familiar geography. And the Chinese are claiming fully 80% of that uh, of that entire water space as as uh, as their own based on this nine or 10 dash line um as as we've been discussing so this this chinese historic model based on the nine dash line conflicts with the unclos and the and the model international law provides and the rights that international law provides to uh to countries like philippines as a coastal state so i want to i want to turn a little bit now for a minute jay to talk about um to talk about Second Thomas Shoal itself, you mentioned a couple of things that I'd like maybe to come back and, and revisit. Um, one of them is, first of all, you refer to it as a shoal. Um, and I'm going to use the word low tide elevation, right? Maybe you can help explain for our listeners what I uh, what I mean by low tide elevation and, mm -hmm. uh, and why the Philippines claims a shoal or a low tide elevation as part of its continental shelf mm -hmm. within its exclusive economic zone. Yeah. Well, a low tide elevation is a shallow area of the sea which appears above water at low tide. Okay, uh, as you know, the tides uh, come and go. At high tide, the shoal is fully submerged, and because of that characteristic, uh, this shoal cannot be considered as land territory that can be the subject of appropriation by any state. Now. Uh, the only way you can claim a low tide elevation is if it were part of the territorial sea of a nearby land territory of the state. But since uh, uh, Second Thomas Shoal is um, far away from any other land territory, uh, its status can only be determined uh, by uh, measuring the distance of the, the nearest uh, um, sovereign territory, which happens to be uh, Palawan, uh, the island province of the Philippines. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's only about 105 nautical miles away. Um, 
China claims absolute sovereignty over the shoal, they say that it is part of the what they call the Nansha Islands or the Spratly Island Group. However, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is more than 12 nautical miles away from the nearest uh, possible island that China could claim. And, and it cannot be part of an EEZ or continental shelf measured from any potential uh, Chinese island, if, assuming that they really did have a valid uh, sovereignty claim over a nearby island in the Sprat lease. The 2016 South China Sea arbitration uh, ruled that none of those islands in the Sprat lease, uh, whether they claimed uh, or whether they belong to the Philippines or China or Vietnam or anyone else, none of those can generate these EEZ and continental shelf zones. So they're only entitled to a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. So a, in the absence of a nearby uh, island or rock with a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles, the Scarborough Shoal can only be part of the EEZ or continental shelf of the Philippines. No? Because yeah. you could imagine that the Philippine EEZ basically there in that southern area is... Um, it's like pockmarked by small enclaves of territorial seas uh, that emanate from each one of these islands and rocks. You know? But beyond 12 nautical miles, it can only be either part of the Philippine Easy and Continental Shelf if it's within 200 miles from Palawan, or it's part of the high seas, uh, which is the common area in the middle uh, that is left uh, when you project all of the EEZs and continental shelves of the surrounding states. Well, thanks very much uh, for that. I've got a bunch of questions, but I noticed that we're stacking up questions from our listeners already. So let's actually take a couple of those uh, um, first. We seem to have a very educated uh, group with us tonight. So um, the first the first question I have, and, and I'll come back to some of the, the law enforcement uh, activities that China is attempting to, um, and the interference activities that China is attempting to, um, to, to do around Second Thomas Shoal. But the first question, the first question I have um, is what does Vietnam say about all of this? Um, does Vietnam have a position on uh Second Thomas Shoal and and uh does does Vietnam uh take a side in any of these issues? Well Vietnam actually took the side of the Philippines in um um um, stating that the islands in the Spratlys are entitled to only 12 nautical mile territorial seas. And therefore, it accepts that a low tide elevation like Scarborough Shoal, uh, the status of that feature can only be determined uh, by uh, seeing if it is within 200 miles of a um, sovereignty, uh, a land territory that is subject to sovereignty of uh, the coastal state. And therefore, they agree that Second Thomas Shoal is part of the Philippine Easy and Continental Shelf. They have actually issued some statements of solidarity with the Philippines, especially when these dangerous maneuvers and, and aggressive activities uh, have been carried out against the Philippines. Um, I believe last year they, they came out with such a statement. And I think this is just proper because on the Vietnamese side, actually uh, China has done far worse uh, against them using uh, the China Coast Guard and militia also. Uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese have uh, sunk uh, a couple of uh, Vietnamese fishing vessels already uh, using the same kinds of uh, tactics uh, against them. Yeah. Um, so one of the questioners has asked, um, what are some of the laws and required measures enforced by the UN to prevent conflict? And here's um, what I think I'd like you to do maybe in thinking about conflict management here, which is maybe uh, focus on... Um, Focus on the, the the mandatory dispute resolution provisions of UNCLA. So so how do they work and and um, how are they meant to prevent conflict? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the first preventive mechanism really was the system of international law, and then that's one reason why the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was proposed uh, and, and negotiations started, and it took over 30 years for it to finally come up, uh, to, to finally emerge as the 82 con 1982 Convention. Uh, UNCLOS was intended to settle uh, then simmering uh, disputes over uh, expansive maritime claims by the various coastal states. And that's why we ended up with this system of the 12 nautical mile territorial sea and the 200 mile easy and continental shelf. So it was intended to settle that. However, uh, it also uh, anticipated the possibility of uh, disputes due perhaps to overlapping claims 
And so it included uh, a very comprehensive uh, part 15 on dispute settlement, which allowed the coastal states to select a peaceful mode of dispute settlement, both uh, what they call both uh, compulsory and, and, and um, um, non-compulsory, which result in non-binding and in binding uh, outcomes. No? So there's a, it's like a menu of options that the coastal states can select from. However, upon uh, ratification of the convention, the states are supposed to select a what they call a compulsory mode of binding dispute settlement. There are four options. I either go to the ICJ, use the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, use a um, um, man, um, um, what you call this ad hoc arbitration, um, and use special arbitration panels. Also, those four options. When you ratify, you're supposed to choose. Hmm. If you don't choose, you're automatically deemed to have selected arbitration as the peaceful mode of dispute settlement. And in the case of the Philippines and China, when they ratified the UNCLOS, they did not make a selection, and therefore, they are uh, um, um, they, they, they therefore are uh, assumed to have selected arbitration as the means of settling disputes between them over the interpretation and application of UNCLOS. Yeah, and that I is what the me, it uh, ask you to pause for one second there, because because this is actually a really important construct that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has built into the system in order mm -hmm. to attempt to resolve these disputes. That when 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 a state chooses to to accede to UNCLOS, it must accept the mandatory dispute resolution process, right? So. Um, so, uh, quite quite frankly, I think one of the reasons that the United States has so far failed to ratify uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is that some members of our Senate are determined not to uh, put the United States in that position. On the other hand, China ratified the, the convention and became a full party to, to it, and therefore, uh, in that ratification prob uh, process, it consented to this mandatory uh, jurisdictional process as a as a dispute resolution mechanism, but also as a mechanism designed to prevent conflict at sea. Sorry, um, you were going to continue. Yes, yes. And, and and this uh, compulsory this dispute resolution process stands um, side by side with the other dispute settlement processes like negotiation and conciliation, but they are uh, in a way like a last resort. No, um, all states, of course, can make use of the various non-binding or non-compulsory uh, non dispute settlement modes. But, but in the case of the Philippines and China, the Philippines has been attempting to negotiate a settlement of, of these issues. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, that is our next question, actually. Let me yeah. let me yeah, put it to you, right? Which is that um, Ken, uh, Ken Wasserman, our longtime uh, US Asia Law Institute, uh, a friend of the Institute ha is asking about this. Um, ha has there been a serious attempt to negotiate a resolution after the arbitration award? Um, and if so, what was what was the, the negotiation process? What was offered by the Philippines and, and, and how does China counter it? Well, um, the negotiations have been ongoing since the 1970s. In fact, it took about 17 years before the Philippines finally decided to take uh, a case to arbitration. And then after the uh, arbitration was handed down in 2016, um, originally the, the plan was to go full into you know negotiations full swing. But then the Duterte administration had uh, um, stepped up to power at that time. And he decided to take a different route. And instead, he just basically accommodated China at every turn. Um, despite what China was doing, like building these artificial islands, deploying its fishing vessels and its military paramilitary forces, Duterte thought that he could keep quiet in exchange for infrastructure development projects and support. Um, at the, by the end of this term, it was very clear that nothing would come out of all the promises. And so the current, the next administration, which is now in power, the Marcos administration, um, did not follow the the trap of uh, Duterte and instead uh, began uh, asserting more um, um, more well began asserting its its the South China Sea arbitration and its rights and entitlements in the South China Sea in accordance with the award. 
Um, there have been, of course, ongoing discussions, but as I understand it, it always ends up with the two sides uh, talking past each other and staring at the ceiling uh, in each bilateral consultation meeting on this. Uh, so there are the, the Philippines has always uh, tried to um, find a negotiated solution, but the problem is China just keeps on doing what it has been doing. So especially, uh, let's say, for example, the negotiations for the Code of Conduct, no? Despite the fact that those perhaps code of explain, negotiations are ongoing, perhaps you China, could explain what the code of conduct is. Okay. First. Yeah. yeah, the code of conduct is actually an effort to come up with rules of behavior, no, uh, for all of the claimants in the South China Sea, both the uh, Southeast Asian claimants and China. It has been ongoing for the what more than twenty five, more than twenty years now. Uh, began in nineteen ninety six, um, but it sort of accelerated in the last few years because China decided to put more effort into it when the case was initiated, when the arbitration was initiated. Uh, but despite the fact that talks were ongoing, it continued to escalate its actions against the Philippines, uh, such as those activities that I showed you on the slides. No, So it's very hard to negotiate uh, a settlement when the other party keeps on creating a fait accompli. No? So what, what is the point of negotiating rules of behavior for Coast Guards when the other side is already using lasers and conducting dangerous maneuvers against you every time their ships meet no? while the uh, negotiations are ongoing? In fact, in the last session, last year, <laughs> the morning of the first session, a collision occurred when uh, China, using these uh, maneuvers again, uh, instigated uh, an incident with that. So it's so very hard to come up with the we'll negotiation. We'll come back to the, uh, to, to, to the activities actually on the water itself, but there still seem to be quite a few questions about the negotiations and 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 the various claims. So um, given all of this, that you know that the that the um, arbitration failed to resolve the disputes, that long-term negotiation has failed to resolve the disputes, and that there isn't a code of conduct that everyone's agreed to to sort of limit escalation. Um, over time, uh, one of the one of the attendees is asking, "What do you see as is China's end game?" Well, its intentions are very clear that it wants to take control of the South China Sea, and it's not because of resources or anything. It's it's primarily because of military uh, uh, for military considerations. It sees the South China Sea as just a security buffer zone to keep the United States Navy particularly as far away from the Chinese coast as possible. And so that's why it has undertaken all of these efforts to build up artificial islands and establish large um, uh, military bases on these islands, even though it costs a lot uh, uh, for them. No? And it's also the reason why they've saturated the area with their militia. No? In addition to the Navy and, and Coast Guard, and I see them ramping up as well their activities in the air. Uh, they've already been doing surveillance flights and they've been practicing through exercises no, uh, on this. So uh, this, however, will not stop with the South China Sea because based on their military strategy, they need to take control of the waters even beyond the South China Sea all the way up to the West Pacific. And that also means that uh, Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines have to fall under China's thumb we have to be subordinate to their security interests essentially and so that's what that's what it wants and it continues to pursue that objective uh, very clearly and and it has not really wavered and so all of these negotiations that it has been undertaking that's why they continue to push outward and expand even while they're talking it's it's what some people have referred to as a talk and take strategy um, and it's um, it has not wavered no, in its position that the South China Sea is theirs by right, by history, even though uh, there is no, actually no independent uh, evidence to corroborate that. All right. Thank you. So um, you have um, you've described for us. Uh, the feature of Second Thomas Shoal as being a low tide elevation. Uh, sometimes these are called drying features. In other words, uh, what's clear is that they're only above water at at uh, low tide. Once the tide comes back in, they're they're uh, submerged again. 
And therefore, as you explained, they cannot be claimed as land, as sovereign land. Um, and so what the law treats them as is the seabed. It's the, the seabed and therefore the continental shelf uh, or the seabed of the exclusive economic zone of the coastal state. In this case, that's the Philippines. What does China say uh, Second Thomas Shoal is and wh why are they fighting so hard over this particular issue? Well, China calls Second Thomas Shoal Renai Reef and it basically has been asserting that it has sovereignty you know, over that reef area, uh, especially if they issue a statement after an incident they will always claim that uh, the Chinese forces acted professionally, quote unquote, and asserted or protected Chinese sovereignty over this area. In their radio warnings to Philippine ships that approach that area, that, that claim of sovereignty also uh, appears uh, or is, is stated from time to time. No, And so... And the way they, they've been doing it, preventing any kind of uh, Philippine activity there, no? cannot be justified really unless it's a claim to absolute sovereignty. No, It's not just a claim to resources as easier continental shelf, but really full and absolute sovereignty. That's what they're doing. And they're claiming it not only against ships, but even against air, no? uh, Philippine aircraft uh, flying over there, as well as other nations' aircraft. No, So they always say, say that it's a violation of Chinese sovereignty, which has absolutely no basis this far out. I mean, this is already around 620 nautical miles away from, from Hainan, which is the nearest land territory of uh, China. Yeah, so, I mean, Chinese um, colleagues have, have told me in particular that um, the Chinese don't recognize the law regarding low tide elevations, that they just simply don't accept um, mm -hmm. that low tide elevations cannot be claimed as sovereign territory. Um, and uh, and so they, I guess, as you say, the, the Chinese have claimed Second Thomas Shoal is their sovereign territory. And therefore, you hear the Chinese uh, sometimes say not one inch. And uh, they refer to, you know, some of this uh, as territory. And though even though it's seabed, they they um, they they treat it as if it's um, like any other uh, Chinese territory. Uh, OK, and so uh, this is. Uh, where we should uh, turn for a little bit and talk about um, the actual activities that are that are going on. You mentioned uh, things like um, the water cannons and the and the lasers. I also read something about a sonic cannon. Have you mm -hmm. heard about that? What's what's going on with what is a sonic cannon and 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 what have you seen in relationship to this? Yes, the a sonic cannon was reported in the last incident. I think. Huh? Uh, basically, these are supposedly non-lethal uh, weapons. Okay? Um, certain types of lasers are called dazzlers. They're designed to blind the people driving a ship. And sonic cannons have been used against uh, pirates operating in the Gulf of Aden. They're basically devices that focus sound, make loud noises. You know, uh, and the loud noises are, are meant to uh, disrupt um the, the people operating uh, vessels no they've often been used on land not to disperse uh, rallies and, and protest movements and in many countries so now they've also been used uh, to disrupt the operations of uh, pirates and unfortunately china is using them against philippine government vessels these are not private persons these are philippine government vessels uh um and 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 this is I think um, uh, this is deliberate in order for China to be able to um, basically coerce um, Philippine government vessels into do so into doing something that they don't want to do to prevent them from accomplishing their mission without, however, crossing the threshold of an outright use of force, which is uh, contrary to international law, as we all know. So uh, it also uh, is intended to uh, create a situation where a, the Philippines, for example, would be forced to respond in a way that allows them to escalate, no? Because the Philippines doesn't have lasers on its coast guard vessels or acoustic cannons, no? So it has the traditional uh, weaponry of of coast guard vessels, which is usually at least one large cannon, a five inch cannon, 
or the um, like the small arms uh, or long arms that uh, uh, that can be mounted on board the ship. It is trying to force the Philippines to respond with those weapons so that it can then have the excuse of escalating and response, responding forcefully now with their cannons. And when they do that, it will not be just one um, ship. It will be all of the ships that they have there responding against one uh, vessel. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I think is worth pointing out here is that um, the Chinese are employing, as you say, non-lethal uh, weapons that tend to be used in, in law enforcement uh, activities. And I think the Chinese um, view this as categorically peaceful. And by that, I mean peaceful as in uh, uh, international law regarding use of force and international humanitarian law. So, um, so, so they they view this as as in the category of peaceful activities, um, as opposed to an armed attack, which of course would be aggression or uh, a use of force that that would trigger self defense rights by by the Philippines. But I personally am not convinced that this is uh, that this is a a peaceful activity, um, uh, and and that it couldn't amount to an armed attack of some kind. Well, especially if if someone is uh, hurt or killed in 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 the process in one of these ship collisions or uh, or yes. even a, a laser dazzling incident that causes yes. significant harm. Um, yes, so I agree, Peter. And yeah. uh, if you consider that, um, you know. Even though these are supposedly non-lethal, like water cannon, they still can cause injury. And given also the nature of the ships we use, they can actually sink a vessel, which can cause casualties. And their militia vessels, which are ostensibly civilian, no? they're designed to ram other ships. They have reinforced hulls, so they're meant to sink and crush other ships. So for for you know this this fine line between peaceful and, and means and, and aggression. I mean, they're really taking advantage of it so that they can actually, um, in a way, use force without using force. No? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what they're doing. But definitely these means, uh, even though supposedly non-lethal, they can still cause injury or even death under the right circumstances. Yeah. That's right. And and I'm of the view that it could trigger uh, uh, national self-defense rights on the part of the Philippines if it does. Um, so uh, one of our listeners is asking the question, all right, it seems like many of these actions taken by the Chinese are, are overtly aggressive. I think using that term in a general sense. Um, what is the rest of the world doing about, about this? Are other countries assisting uh, the Philippines? Well, uh, before especially under the Duterte administration, which was accommodating China at every turn, the other countries could not really say much other than to try to issue statements uh, against the heightening of tensions. And this is really because for all practical intents and purposes, Second Thomas Schultz particularly is an issue only between the Philippines and China. The other countries do not have a direct stake on Second Thomas Schultz. However, in in the past year, that has changed because I think the other countries, number one, have seen the Philippines uh, um, act more assertively. They have become more proactive in solic soliciting um, even just moral support from other countries. Second, they've also seen the increased aggressiveness of China. And they know that if China can be allowed to do it against a small country like the Philippines, Nothing prevents it from doing the same things against other countries. No? And for maritime powers, I think what has been uh, what has changed really is that they've seen how uh, China's actions really are in the long run intended to deny uh, freedoms of navigation over flight through this area. Uh, if China is able to get all the surrounding countries in Southeast Asia to fall in line and agree that this area is not subject to such freedoms of navigation and overflight, it will be very difficult for outside powers, uh, countries outside of uh, Southeast Asia to to, uh, to oppose that. No? And they will have to uh, then, um, well, by implication, they will have to then accept a situation where uh, the South China Sea, this large area, is is basically going to be a Chinese lake. And also by implication, that means that the entire system of the Law of the Sea Convention will begin to fall apart because if China can claim such a large ocean space as its own territory, sovereign territory, what prevents other countries from doing the same thing in other parts of the world? 
Yeah, I in fact, I just published a piece this week on making that exact same point that uh, you might have seen it. It was uh, published in London by the Council on Geostrategy. And it's the, the bottom line is um, China seems to be attempting to remake the law uh, of the sea in its own uh, fashion to, to, to accommodate its interests without recognizing that perhaps this is now opening the door to other states to begin to do the same. Uh, it's it's a bit of a concern. But coming back to this point about what other states are doing, uh, uh, do I, I I think I've been reading lately that uh, that Japan has been uh, quite supportive in in uh, providing assistance to some of the states uh, in the South China Sea to help uh, build Coast Guard capacity, for instance. Uh, what, what's going on there? Well, uh, Japan has been a long-time partner of the Philippines, especially when it came to the Coast Guard. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, became a fully civilian agency in the 1990s. Uh, and Japan, from the very beginning, has supported it through capacity building programs and capability building. In recent years, it has uh, provided ships for, to enable the Philippines to patrol its EEZ, beginning with a fleet of 10 smaller craft, the ones that we're often using now in the West Philippine Sea. And it has also started to give uh, lar um, larger ships. No? Uh, the Philippines has uh, worked very closely with Japan on this, and I think Japan has a very has played a really major role in the growth of the Philippine Coast Guard. No? Uh, so now they've uh, also been in talks to do um, provide um, radars. Uh, I think they just um, inaugurated one facility uh, last month. No and more ships are coming and there is closer coordination as well in terms of information sharing no and this is not just because of the south china sea but uh, also because japan uh, i mean its lines of communication its energy supplies and trade routes pass through the south china sea so the philippines and japan are actually natural allies and partners when it comes to ensuring that all nations are able to exercise their rights in the south china sea in accordance with international law Hmm, yeah. Um, and I, I know, I mean, the United States has a security uh, alliance with uh, with the Philippines that has been um, uh, expanding, I suppose, in some ways, but specifically around Second Thomas Shoal, uh, what American naval activities have 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 been undertaken? Well, um, it's not very visible, but actually there is a more or less consistent presence of uh, the U.S. Navy in that area. During um, resupply missions, um, I think for the past uh, year or two, there has also often been a, uh, a, an American surveillance aircraft uh, just watching what's going on, you know, uh, keeping tabs and, and making recordings, I guess, of, of uh, the activities. That's why in the past year, the Philippines has had access to some of the uh, aerial footage of, uh, of the activities of the various vessels. You know? Uh, in addition to its own uh, footage using drones based on the ships as well as cameras on board. So this are, uh, provides us with a very good uh, picture of what is going on. And that's how we're able to expose uh, the more uh, pernicious activities of the China Coast Guard and the Chinese Maritime Militia uh, against our Coast Guard and resupply vessels. Mm, yeah, I, I had read in, in the news about uh, there being um, a P-8, I guess, um, mm -hmm. Uh, sort of circling above, just keeping an eye on on what's going on, um, and uh, other states. Uh, oh, I should go back and say the United States um, uh, alliance with the F Philippines. It's a mutual uh, defense agreement, and it um, uh, it's about defense of territory, but also defense of naval vessels uh, attacked at sea. Um, and so, what we're talking about here are Coast Guard vessels from the Philippines, but also the Chinese are are using Coast Guard vessels at the same time as well. Um, so, uh, any comments about that, or or can should we move on? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, in issuing the bilateral defense guidelines in the middle of last year, the Philippines and the United States uh, clarified that the mutual defense treaty applies as, uh, as well to all troops, vessels, and aircraft including uh, Coast Guards no, uh, uh, operating in the South China Sea. So that helps to really clarify the yeah. uh, applicability of the treaty, especially to the units operating out there. Well, this should serve as an escalation management tool as well, that um, while Chinese are using some pretty aggressive uh, or assertive um, 
uh, non-lethal weapons. Hopefully it won't escalate uh, beyond that because of the implication of the de defense uh, treaty in relationship to it. Now, I understand that um, there's been an increasing number of uh, contacts between the Philippines and Australia as well. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, yes. Um, especially during the Trump administration, Australia really uh, saw the importance of uh, the Philippines and 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 the U.S. Uh, to its interests, no, and the importance of maintaining uh, access and all the freedoms of navigation over flight in the South China Sea. So they ramped up their cooperation with the Philippines uh, in in many on many levels, actually, uh, both civilian and military. Uh, on the military side, we've had for uh, several years before, uh, several years now, a status of forces agreement, which is, which is a way for the Philippines to, uh, for the Australians to be able to uh, operate within the Philippines, no. Uh, and then they've also improved uh, capacity building and uh, capability building uh, for the Philippines. Uh, they provided training, as well as uh, some um, equipment, and also participated in exercises. So. Uh, like Japan, uh, Australia sees the Philippines um, as a natural ally given its position uh, within the region. It really needs the Philippines to help uh, protect its own interests in freedoms of navigation and overflight through the region. Hmm. Yeah, just a, a follow up on that. I mean, uh, India has uh, been pursuing a bit more of a look east policy as well. And I'm curious whether uh, India has involved itself more. I know it has with Vietnam, for instance, occasionally, and it's done exercises uh, 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 in the Sea of Japan and in the West, uh, in, in the Western Pacific Ocean. I'm just wondering if it's building ties with the Philippines as well. Well, it has, uh, although it's been a lot more... Um understated i guess uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's it's because of the well not just the distance but also the kinds of assets that they can de deploy in this area but i have heard that occasionally an indian vessel or aircraft uh, would operate in the south china sea and um it, there would be some form of uh, coordination uh, or at least notice with with the philippines you know, on on this uh, activities it's mm -hmm. just that uh, i guess india is not yet uh, that visible and maybe the in terms of its operations in this region, it's uh, not as uh, as much as uh, the other countries like uh, Australia and Japan. Hmm. Would you say that there are any countries uh, openly siding with China on this issue? Well, good question. I, have re I haven't really heard of a country really openly and very loudly saying that the Philippines doesn't have any of its rights uh, or entitlements in the South China Sea. At best, there would be countries that keep quiet <laughs> and say, do not object to China's statements, I think. No? Many, At some many point, have, uh, economic interests with regard to China. And so, yes, I uh, I say at I see your point about at best, some countries might just keep quiet uh, in, in terms of their economic interests without actively supporting China. But uh, within ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian States, uh, aren't there one or two countries that maybe try to side with China? Well, there are countries that are seen as siding with China on, on most issues, including this. And, and perhaps it's understandable. Uh, this would be Cambodia and Laos. Uh, and that's that's because they're, they're basically uh, continental countries uh, and, and they share borders with China. And they have huge economic dependencies uh, with China. So in a way, we can't really expect much from them. But during uh, negotiations uh, for like the COC, uh, they participate and they do provide some inputs. Not all are, are uh, helpful to our cause, essentially. But uh, in a way, it's, it's already accepted as a, an obstacle, shall we say, no? uh, to our interests as well. Yeah. So um, I, I want to ask a little bit, uh, since we only have a few minutes left, about five minutes left, I want to ask a little bit about uh, the value of Second Thomas Shoal in the larger region, specifically um, oil and gas and other resources that, that might be in the region. So um, what's the larger value of control of Second Thomas Shoal? Yeah. Well, in relation to oil and gas, uh, particularly, you know, uh, 
the Philippines uh, continental shelf has been largely unexplored for petroleum. It's partly because we've been very slow. Uh, our rate of exploration has only been one-tenth of that of Vietnam and Malaysia historically. And it's gotten even lower, I think, in the past uh, under the previous administration. Uh, but it is also the most uh, prospective area for oil and gas, particularly Reed Bank, which is just uh, north of Second Thomas Shoal. The Philippines has been exploring that area for oil since the 1970s, and there have been quite a number of discoveries, except that they were not commercially viable. There has been a discovery of a large uh, natural gas reserve, uh, and that is the subject of a service contract, but the contract has not um, been implemented because of the increased pressure from China. No, uh, Even though it was issued in 2010, up until last year, the contractor had not been able to carry out the development drilling. No? So second Thomas Shoal uh, is, if it were to be taken over by the Chinese, it would be the closest now to the Philippines uh, if it were to build anything there. Uh, and it would allow them to cut off most of the remaining Philippine outposts from the area. It would provide a good place to to um, put ships on standby, ready to intercept any other approaching uh, Philippine vessel from the Palawan side, uh, the, from the island Palawan. It's a good place to intercept them from. It's also a good place to intercept uh, any other maritime traffic because it's next to what we call the Palawan Trough, which is a major sea lane. Uh, so oil and gas operations in the Philippines, I think, would be would become e even more difficult no? Uh, than they already are now if China were to uh, take over uh, Second Thomas Shoal. And, and so that's that's why it was chosen, really, I think. no. Uh, when the Philippines decided to uh, put the Sierra Madre there, it was a good, um, it provided a good vantage point for monitoring activities. And so for the same reason, it would also be a good uh, place to conduct uh, interception and interference activities against other states. Now, do I understand also that other Philippine oil and gas um, activities are sort of beginning to run their course? And so, um, you know, uh, opening up new areas such as in uh, Reed Bank would be would be helpful, would be important. Yes, um, we're actually we have a looming energy crisis because we have had only one major natural gas production facility in all these years. And. It was originally supposed to run out in 2024. That's this year. And it needed new uh, supplies. And the discovery in Reed Bank was supposed to uh, take that on. But because of these disputes, that has been delayed. And, and so the natural gas processing plants, uh, the pipelines, etc., they might, uh, you know, they might, might end up um, um, having to get LNG supplies and actually I think the government and the government has actually prepared for that contingency they will have to use LNG instead but that's going to be more expensive and possibly even more volatile now and if they're going to be brought on board ships they're going to be more vulnerable really to Chinese interference uh, in the future so um, unfortunately um, um, it takes at least 10 years for any kind of development to you know to produce the gas and and make it useful and so we're already well delayed on that um the other energy options like renewable energy that can provide some uh, relief but it cannot really make up for the loss of what we call base load the consistent supply uh of of energy to um to, to address the, the energy needs of the country. So our energy security as well as our economic development are actually uh, adversely affected by our by China be, keeping us from accessing our own uh, natural resources, energy resources here in the, in the West Philippine Sea. Well, uh, Jay, uh, Jay Batangbakal, I cannot thank you enough for uh, helping us to understand the legal issues the geostrategic issues, the military issues, the law enforcement issues, uh, the international relations issues, and even economic issues uh, that are uh, that are all of um, surrounding this flashpoint in in the South China Sea. 
Um, so uh, we'll we'll say good night, but we'll uh, and good morning to you. I hope you have a, a good rest of your day. And I want to thank you for for your uh, kind support and for our listeners for their great questions today.